<laughs> Welcome to tonight's presentation. My name is Sadie Thayer, and I'm the museum director here at the Kittitas County Historical Museum. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's presentation. We're all gathered here tonight to learn more, come together and experience, to share ideas and walk away, hopefully with a greater understanding of the, of the topic at hand. So just as a courtesy reminder, please keep the conversation civil and respectful to the presenter, to others in the audience and to the museum staff who helped guide this presentation so we can all have an enjoyable time. As we begin tonight's event, I would like to recognize that we are gathered together on the historic homelands of the Kittitas and the Pishwanapum peoples, and recognize that these bands today are part of the Yakima Nation, a uh, federally recognized Native nation constituted under the Treaty with the Yakimas of 1855. The indigenous stewards of this land practice a subsistence style through fishing, hunting, and gathering since time immemorial and remain committed stewards of this land, cherishing it, protecting it, and using it as instructed by their elders through generations and actively practicing the traditions and culture as, na as neighbors in the Ellensburg community. We are especially thankful to the Kittitas and Pishwanapum bands of indigenous people who have allowed us to learn from and share their stories and traditions with visitors from all across the world as we serve as the cultural custodians of their basketry, beadwork, and other items. I would also like to thank our membership for making tonight's presentation possible. Membership dues go to fund the lecture series each year, as well as care for and support our collections and exhibits. So if you're a member in the audience tonight, I especially want to thank you for your support. If you're not a member yet, and I can say the keyword yet, please consider becoming one and help support what we do. After tonight's program, we're gonna ask that you fill out a small survey of just maybe five questions uh, so that we and our presenters, uh, or presenter rather, uh, can receive relevant feedback. It's important to know um, how we did and so that we can know how we can do better. Um, our program tonight is presented by Eric Vickery. Eric is an Illinois native with a lifelong love of baseball. He has written dozens of articles as a member of the Society for American Baseball Research and is now the author of two books, Running Redbirds, the World Champion 18, or 1982 St. Louis Cardinal, published by McFarland Books in 2023, and the book you're all here to learn about tonight, Season of Shattered Dreams, Post-War Baseball, The Spokane Indians, and a Tragic Bus Crash That Changed Everything, which was published just this last week by Roman and Little Bill and released a few days ago. And if you haven't picked up your copy yet, it's for sale in our gift shop. So please join me in welcoming Eric Vickery. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Sadie, for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here and to share this uh, important uh, story from Washington history, Pacific Northwest history, and baseball history. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about myself and how I became a baseball fan and came to write this book. Uh, I grew up in Alton, Illinois, which is about 20 miles from St. Louis. And from a pretty early age, this is me at uh, about age five or six, uh, meeting Fred Bird uh, in my hometown. Mm -hmm. And around that same year, I went to my first game at Bush Stadium in St. Louis, and I was pretty much hooked right away. Um, if you remember the 1980s Cardinals, they played a really entertaining style of baseball. It was built on speed and defense. They stole 200 bases a year. Um, it's a really exciting uh, time uh, to be a, a Cardinal fan, and that kind of uh, drew me in, and I was a, uh, I've been a fan ever since. Um, I played the game as well. Uh, the picture on the right is me in high school. I had the opportunity to play at Bush Stadium, which was a, a real treat for me. Uh, and then I've always remained a Cardinal fan. This is me and my wife, uh, Gina, in uh, 2011. We had the uh, 
fortunate opportunity to attend the World Series that year and see the Cardinals win it all. It's another mm -hmm. highlight of my, my baseball fandom. So I was essentially just a, a baseball fan uh, for most of my life uh, until about 2020. Uh, during that pandemic, I was uh, looking for something to pass time, more or less. Uh, in the early days of the pandemic, when we were mostly stuck inside, uh, the baseball season at that point was on pause. Uh, so I started writing these articles for the Society for American Baseball Research. Uh, and I started by writing about some of the guys that I had grown up um, watching play, guys like William McGee and Tom Herr, um, and focused on also some uh, Pacific Northwest uh, players as well. And that kind of led me to um, write my first book, which is about the 1982 Cardinals. Uh, that came out last year. Uh, that was the uh, the one year during that decade they they won the uh, World Series. Although they went to the World Series uh, in '85 and '87 as well. <laughs> so during this time, uh, maybe 2021 or so, I was writing um, researching an article about John Leavich. He was a a player who uh, had one major league base hit, and it came off of Bob Feller. Mm -hmm. And uh, Leovich played for the Bremerton Blue Jackets in 1946. So I was just kind of combing through the newspaper archives and came across um, a shocking headline. And that was uh, that the this team, uh, the Spoken Indians, had been involved in this bus crash. And um, you know, being a baseball fan all of my life, I was pretty surprised that I had never heard of this story until, um, until that time, just a few years ago. Um, so it really stuck in the back of my mind, um, just the horrific nature and uh, tragic details of the crash. Um, shortly thereafter, I read a book about, a, about the 1946 season called The Victory Season. Uh, it's a pretty good book, and uh, it was just a single paragraph in that, that book about uh, the crash. But again, it kind of kept coming up and was in the back of my mind, and I kind of wanted to know more about this team and, and the story. So I did what, what we all do when we're curious about people and, and started, you know, just doing a little bit of basic research and uh, learning a little bit more, more about this team and this crash. And one of the first uh, things I came across was uh, an article um, online that had been published in 1994 in Sports Illustrated, and it was about uh, the life of Jack Lorkey. Which is a uh, who led a very extraordinary life, as I'll get into later. Uh, but that kind of uh, I learned quite a bit more about the team and the, the, uh, the accident, um, and really the, the seed uh, that was sown at that point. Um, and I decided I wanted to really pursue this as kind of my next writing project. I didn't know whether it would be just a, maybe an essay or um, or what, what it would entail. Uh, this is. Uh, the team's baseball reference page. So this is, uh, as a baseball uh, historian, I guess you could say, I, this is where I get a lot of my uh, information. That's where all, all the, it's like an online baseball encyclopedia. So I went to the team's webpage, and it's just a really long list of names, it's 50 names or so. Um, you can't tell what players were involved uh, in the accident, uh, because essentially it was two teams. There was a team before the accident, and a team after the accident, but uh, on Baseball Reference, for example, it's just one long list. So um, I really wanted to dive into this, uh, tell the stories of the, the people involved, and um, and that turned into what became uh, this book. So once I was all in on, on writing this this, uh, this book and pursuing this project, I um, started using various uh, sources for my research. Uh, fortunately, these days, um, newspapers.com is a tremendous uh, way to find uh, old newspaper articles. Uh, I imagine 20 or 30 years ago, you would have had to gone to a library and looked at microfilm. Now, now you can just go online, uh, type in a date and keywords, and you get hundreds of uh, newspaper articles that pop up. So that was extremely helpful as I was um, learning more about uh, the scene and the, these players. Uh, Ancestry.com also proved to be very helpful. There's a wealth of information, including uh, birth and marriage records, census reports, uh, military records, and so forth. 
Uh, the King County Coroner and Spokane County Court records were uh, also helpful in providing uh, information, uh, particularly around the details of the, the crash and the aftermath. Uh, I read whatever books I could find about baseball uh, in the era of World War II. Uh, this uh, accident took place in 1946, so the year after the war, but um, all of these men had uh, were certainly impacted by the war, so I just tried to learn everything I could about uh, those preceding years. Uh, fortunately, I was able to interview uh, some of the descendants of the players. Uh, the, the players involved in this story were mostly born in the 19 uh, teens and 20s, so uh, of course, the, uh, no one's uh, around from that, that period. I was able to contact uh, children, again, grandchildren, nieces, and nephews who were able to provide um, varying amounts of information. Some descendants knew very little about their relatives, whereas uh, in a few cases, uh, they had scrapbooks that were just full of uh, information. Um, I was fortunate to interview uh, a few players who played for Ben Gary, who's a, a key figure in this story and book. Um, ben uh, had a long managerial career in the minor leagues, and I was able to interview five or six players, um, including Tommy John, who's probably the most well-known of those. Uh, as I mentioned, the scrapbooks of the players involved um, proved to be extremely helpful, including handwritten letters by some players themselves. Um, this is an example of one of those letters. This was uh, uh, written by uh, Bob Patterson, who was an outfielder on the team. Um, he was in the uh, minor leagues uh, just before uh, serving uh, in the military during the war. So he wrote a, a letter to his family just describing um, kind of what he was going through. And he played in the uh, minor leagues in uh, Idaho that year. And, um, uh, extremely uh, helpful. And, Kind of getting in the mind of the, the players and uh, what they were thinking uh, during those years. So this story takes place in 1946. So I figured I would uh, start by going back to that year and setting the scene a little bit about what was going on uh, in the country. Uh, on one hand, there was I think a, a good amount of jubilation that the, the war was over. Um, uh, in many ways, people were ready to get back to some sense of normalcy, but. Uh, that wasn't necessarily the case uh, because of uh, shortages of food and housing. There was rising inflation where wages remained stagnant. In infrastructure, including transportation, had kind of fallen in disrepair. Um, in the years during World War II, uh, most materials and uh, things went towards the war effort. So in some ways, um, Things on the home front had sort of fallen, uh, fallen behind. Uh, millions of auto workers, meat packers, electrical workers, teamsters, and railroad employees went on strike that year. <clears throat> and then there was baseball. And during World War II, of course, baseball continued at the encouragement of President Roosevelt, who thought it was important that the game continue uh, for morale for, for the troops and to give people. Uh, here in the States, something something to do after work. Um, they ended up playing a lot more night games. Yeah. Um, although the major leagues continued, the, the minor leagues were greatly affected. Uh, before the war, there had been 44 minor leagues in operation across the country. During the war, that was reduced to nine. Just, there just weren't enough players to fill the uh, minor league roster. So a lot of leagues uh, folded or uh, shut down during that time. But in 1946, all these troops were now returning from the war and were ready to, uh, in many cases, try to resume their, their baseball careers, including the Western International League, which was the league that the Spokane Indians played in. So the WIL, or Western International League, included eight teams, Spokane Indians, Tacoma Tigers, Bremerton Blue Jackets, Wenatchee Chiefs, Salem Senators, Vancouver Capilanos, which was named after uh, uh, ML6 uh, Brewery in Vancouver, uh, the Victoria Athletics, and the Yakima Stars. So I figured I would talk a little bit about uh, Spokane, since that's where the team was based, and uh, describe um, baseball in Spokane in the early years. Um, 
So Kan developed in the late 1800s uh, with the movement west of uh, European settlers. Uh, the population, sorry, it strikes me, uh, exploded from 350 people in 1880 to more than 100,000 uh, just 30 years later. So Spokane was really a bustling uh, city around the turn of the century as people came west uh, looking for gold, silver, and a better life. And of course, when settlers came, they brought baseball. The first professional game was played in Spokane in May of 1890 at a field called Twickenham Park. Uh, they played in a league that included uh, four teams. They all had very uh, unusual names. The Portland, uh, the Spokane team rather was called the Bunch Grassers. And I, I've not been able to find out what that means. Uh, you had the Tacoma Daisies, the Portland Whitefeet, and yeah. the Seattle Hustlers. <laughs> so that was, uh, they, Folded after a few seasons, and a couple other leagues kind of came and went uh, until another league was formed in 1901. Uh, around that time, the team really didn't have a, a name, per se. Uh, a couple of years later, the newspaper in Spokane, the Spokesman Review, held it to adopt an official team name, and the uh, winning selection was the Inlanders. Uh, but a couple months later, for some reason, the newspaper started referring to the team as the Indians. <laughs> No explanation as to what you've seen. So in the early 1900s, uh, Indians played at a ballpark called Natatorium, which is uh, pictured here. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, the foul pulled out in the uh, left field line uh, was a pine tree. In 1905, the team relocated to a recreation park. Uh, a field that was so big that no player hit a home run until the third season there. So it was quite an expansive uh, field. Uh, it's three uh, well-known uh, players, well-known for different reasons. And, uh, Hall of Famers Stan Kowalewski and George High Pockets Kelly played for the uh, Indians in the 1910s, as well as two players who received lifetime bans, including one member of the uh, 1919 Chicago White Sox that, of course, was involved in the uh, Black Sox scandal, that was a sweet uh, risper. Uh, another guy, Shufflin Phil Douglas, um, offered to skip games in order to hurt the New York Giants playoff chances in uh, 1922, and he also received a lifetime ban. Uh, so during the Great Depression and uh, World War I, uh, following that, uh, 1921 to 1936, um, there was no baseball in Spokane. Uh, until 1937, when the Western International League uh, was formed, uh, the Indians played at a field called uh, Ferris Field. Uh, they were in a Class B uh, league. And nowadays, we have single A, double A, triple A. Back then, it was uh, A, B, C, D. Uh, so a B league was, would be equivalent to roughly to like a double A team back then. Uh, the Spokane team was uh, first called the Hawks during their first couple of years, and that was because there was another team called the Indians already, uh, the Seattle Indians, which later changed their name to uh, the Rainiers in the, the Coast League. Uh, those uh, Indians teams, uh, the name was changed to the Indians in 1939. Uh, the team had some good success in 1940 and 41. Uh, they finished in first place and won the um, League title uh, the following year, 41. Uh, this picture here is uh, uh, includes two of the players who are involved in the story. Uh, on the left is uh, Bob Penniman here, and then uh, fourth here sitting down is Levi McCormick, who uh, played for the Indians before the war, and then both those players came back and played uh, in 1946 for the team. Uh, this is what Ferris Field looked like in 1937. By 1946, they had added a roof um, over the uh, infield stands here to, to cover up the um, patrons. Uh, this is a team photo from 1941. Uh, I just love the, the uh, vivid uh, imagery here. Uh, the team owner was uh, Bill Ulrich. Um, and again, you had uh, Bob Kinnaman and uh, Leave out a quarterback to the players uh, involved in the story or in this photo. So once 
Baseball started to reorganize the minor leagues, that is, after the war, including uh, the Western International League. Uh, Bill Homework uh, sold the franchise um, in the fall of 45 to a guy named Sam Collins, who operated a cigar shop in um, Idaho. Um, Sam had previously owned uh, minor league teams in uh, a couple of Idaho towns. Uh, interestingly, he had one leg from a um, uh, accident earlier in his life. And first thing he did was hire a manager. And he settled on a guy named Glenn Wright, who was a very successful uh, major league player for the New York Giants and uh, Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, interestingly, uh, one of Wright's claim to fame, he was one of 15 players in major league history to start turn an unassisted triple play. Which I think is probably the most rare uh, play in all of baseball. So once they had a manager, uh, the next uh, goal was to fill a roster. Uh, and so Sam Collins uh, met with uh, different teams in the Pacific Coast League, trying to form working agreements because he, he needed to uh, fill out a roster with anyone to get uh, talented players as he could. He also signed some players on his own, but the Spokane Indians operated as an independent franchise. You know, nowadays, we think of uh, most minor league teams have affiliations with major league teams. Back then, some teams just ran independently and they formed sort of informal working agreements with other clubs to fill out the rosters. That's what uh, Sam Collins did with the New York Yankees and two Pacific Coast League teams, the Oakland Oaks and San Diego Padres. Uh, the Indians had a three week spring training uh, in Marysville, California. The weather was a little bit better down there than Spokane in early April and uh, also provided them the proximity to play games against some other teams. Uh, so this is actually uh, a photo that ran in one of the Spokane newspapers of the uh, some of the players who uh, were local to the Spokane area uh, before they uh, departed by bus to go to Marysville. Uh, important thing to remember with the story is most of these men had, had just served in, in World War II. So the day before the season was to start, uh, there was some shocking news. Glenn Wright, the, the same player who turned the unassisted triple play, was fired uh, the day before season opener. Turned out that uh, Wright, this was later reported in the newspapers, had gone on a bender. He uh, on the trip back from California for spring training. He was drunk the whole time, and uh, Sam Collins uh, was kind of fed up with that, and, and he fired him, and he hired the uh, team's catcher, Mel Cole, uh, pictured here, would be the team's manager. So Cole was, I think, 27 years old, had uh, spent the previous three to four years serving in the Pacific uh, in the war, had played in the Yankees farm system uh, for a few years uh, before the war. He was from uh, Stockton, California, uh, and attended Sacramento High School. He was signed by the Yankees out of high school before his um, 44 months uh, in the military during the war. So I'll kind of get into uh, some of the other players on the team and, and who they were and, and where they came from. Next is Jack Lorkey. Uh, Lorkey was 22 years old. Uh, he was born and raised in uh, Los Angeles. And he signed uh, as a teenager to play with the San Diego Padres. Uh, played one year with the Twins Falls Cowboys in 1942, before uh, he was drafted into the Army. Jack served in the 216th Field Artillery Battalion in General Patton's 3rd Army and fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, he spent uh, nearly two years overseas uh, during the war. Now, when Jack came back from the war, he took a ship uh, from Europe uh, back to New York, and he was about to take the first flight of his life Back, to, back home in California. At the last minute, however, a higher ranking officer bumped him from the plane, took his seat, much to Jack's chagrin. That plane later stopped to refuel in Kansas City. The plane took off and crashed, killing all 20 men before. So Jack had already had some close calls with that uh, at this point. Another player on the team, uh, the oldest player on the team at age 33, was second baseman Ben Garrity, who had 
uh, and joined the uh, Indians about a month into the season. Uh, Gary was born in New Jersey, uh, went to Villanova University, and was uh, signed by the Dodgers uh, out of college, and went straight from college to the major leagues. Played with the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers under Casey Stengel in 1936. Uh, was really good for a couple of weeks. He hit over 300, but then, uh, then struggled after that. And, uh, he later said that he realized he didn't have the physical tools to uh, sort of make it uh, in the major league. So he uh, kind of set his sights on maybe being a coach or a manager. He hung around Casey Stengel. Uh, they have beers after games and talk baseball, and he, he learned a lot from Casey. Uh, during the war, Garrity went and uh, moved to California and worked at an uh, aircraft a military plant. Um, and was talked uh, by Casey Stengel back in uh, coming to play for the Boston Braves during the war. Uh, the major leagues were, of course, uh, in some ways desperate to find able-bodied men to play, uh, and Stengel had uh, admired Garrity's uh, work ethic um, when he had it with the Dodgers and, and talked to him in coming. So Ben played a, a couple of years during the war, and then uh, by 1946, he was put back in the minor leagues and ended up in, in Spokane. I mentioned this already. Ben went to uh, Villanova at 381 in his first uh, 15 games. The youngest player on the team was Vic Pachetti. He was uh, 18 years old and the first baseman from San Francisco, California. He was born to uh, Italian immigrants and fell in love with baseball from an early age. Um, much like myself, he, uh, around the age of five or six, was already, already playing uh, baseball. By the time he got to high school, high school was uh, enjoying a great deal of success. He led his team to the uh, city championship, led his uh, American Legion team to the national tournament in Billings. And at uh, age 16, was selected to play in an uh, All-American game that was sponsored by Esquire magazine. This was a, a game in which they chose players from around the country, teenagers, to come and play at this, like an all-star game. And Vic was chosen uh, to play and represent Northern California at the game. So he took a train from San Francisco to New York. The game was uh, played at Polo Grounds. There's some, um, this is uh, Vic Pachetti here. And he's standing next to Mel Ott, who was the manager of the team. His coach was Carl Hubble, another Hall of Famer. And here on the left is a player who played on Vic's team. That's Richie Ashburn, another Hall of Famer, who was a teenager from um, Nebraska. The game was played on August 7th, Polo Grounds. Uh, before the game, Abbott and Costello performed. Uh, on the same trip, the players got to appear on Babe Ruth's radio show. Babe had a, a radio show he hosted every Saturday morning, and, and Vic and his teammates got to meet the Babe and uh, appear on the show. So it was, imagine Vic had never left San Francisco in his life uh, before this, and suddenly he's taking a, a trip across the country. Um, without his parents, I might add, you know, uh, a reporter from the San Francisco Chronicle accompanied him, uh, but other than that, he was was on his own uh, with his, his teammates. I don't think you'd see that happen nowadays. <laughs> um, so I mentioned that Mel Ott and uh, Carl Hubble coached Vic's team from the West. The East team was uh, coached by Connie Mack. The East team also featured uh, Billy Pierce here, who's a uh, uh, went on to have, have a long major league career as a pitcher, won more than 200 games uh, for the Tigers. Uh, in the uh, All-American game, Vic actually hit against um, Billy Pierce and hit a double in his first rebound. So Vic really made an impression. Uh, Red Barber, who was the uh, broadcaster, uh, was said to have went overboard for the Frisco kid. Uh, during that same trip, uh, trip Branch Rickey, well known for signing Jackie Robinson, dined with Pachetti and tried to lure him to Brooklyn, uh, as did the uh, New York Giants owner, Horace Stoneham. Uh, Joe Devine, a scout who had signed Joe DiMaggio, said he had no doubt Pachetti would make the major leagues. 
and calls him, uh, quote, a natural. But Vic had other uh, thoughts. He was still at this point, um, at age 17, he had a year of high school left to go as well. And so he decided to sign with the Oakland Oaks, uh, just across the bay from his hometown. And part of it was uh, Vic's idol, Dolph Camilli, who had uh, been a, um, who like Vic was the first baseman from San Francisco, born um, to an Italian American family. Uh, so he was sort of a natural uh, role model for, for Vic. And so Vic uh, and Dolph was uh, managing the Oakland Oaks that year. So Vic decided to sign with that team so he could play for his idol um, and be close to home so he could finish high school. However, Dolph Miller was fired uh, in the 19, during the 1945 season and subsequently replaced by uh, Casey Stengel. And it was Casey Stengel who actually sent Vic Pichetti to Spokane in the spring of 46 so he could gain more experience. The other player on the team, uh, Levi McCormick, uh, he was a 32 year old outfielder uh, born in Idaho. He was a member of the Nez Perce tribe. He had attended Washington State and was a three sports star there. Also spent time in the Pacific Coast League with the Seattle Indians slash Grenadiers in the 30s. Uh, served in the Navy during World War II and played for the Pasco Flyers, uh, a very successful baseball team, the Navy team. Bob Kenneman was a uh, pitcher, right hander. He uh, grew up in rural southwest uh, Washington and uh, grew up hunting and um, developed uh, sharp shooting uh, skills uh, that uh, served him well in the military. Like uh, McCormick, he also attended Washington State. He played uh, like McCormick with the Spokane Indians uh, before the war and then served in the Army. Uh, interesting fact about Bob, uh, when he was playing with the uh, Indians before the war, he took a line drive uh, that hit him right square in the mouth and knocked out eight of his teeth. <laughs> so Bob tried to join the Navy, but they rejected him because of his uh, missing teeth. And so he had to join the uh, Navy. Instead. This is uh, Levi McCormick here and then Bob Kinnaman to his right. And this is Ido Vanny, who is a, a pretty successful Pacific Coast League uh, player from Seattle. The other player on the team is Bob Patterson, who is a very talented uh, center fielder like uh, Pichetti, uh, born and raised in San Francisco, actually went to the same high school as Pichetti, he was a couple years older. Uh, Patterson signed with the Oakland Oaks and spent the 42 uh, season with the uh, Idaho Falls Russets uh, and led the team in hitting. Um, that letter I showed you earlier um, was written by him that season. Uh, he served in the Coast Guard during the war and played on a service team called the Surf Riders, and they competed against uh, several major leaguers, and he actually hit a home run uh, against uh, a major league pitcher during that uh, during his time in the Coast Guard. Chris Harchie was a catcher with the Spokane Indians. He actually signed uh, just about a week before the, uh, the accident. He was 31 years old. He had, like uh, Garrity, had a cup of coffee with the Brooklyn Dodgers. He played in 1939 under Leo DeRocher, had a few hits, five hits and 16 at bats. And like Patterson served in the Coast Guard during the war. And as I mentioned, he had just joined the uh, Indians uh, on June 20th. That was, uh, the Indians were pretty talented uh, in the infield and outfield. They had been kind of searching for a catcher. They weren't getting much production uh, out of that position. And so Sam Collins, the owner, uh, signed Archie, this guy who had big league experience uh, on June 20th. The team shortstop was George Risk, who was uh, from a small town uh, here in Washington. He attended Pacific University in Portland and uh, served in the uh, Army uh, stationed in Utah. Um, one interesting thing I, think I found in the newspaper uh, archives was that um, I guess during in the Army uh, where he was stationed, his uh, superiors did not want the players playing on semi pro teams, so instead they would use aliases. Uh, to uh, play. That later came out uh, after the war, but George uh, used an alias so, so he could play uh, baseball during the war. Uh, Bob James was the team's right fielder. He was from Arizona. Uh, he had grown up on a, a ranch there. Uh, attended Santa Clara University for one year until he was uh, enticed to sign with the New York Yankees. 
Uh, during the war, he uh, served in the Navy for a bit and also performed agricultural work. Uh, Freddie Martinez was an uh, uh, infielder slash outfielder from San Diego. He was born uh, to first generation of Mexican Americans. Also served in the Navy during the war and um, played against a, a bunch of major leaguers uh, while stationed in Hawaii and held his own. He was roommates with uh, Jack Dorkey and Bob James. A couple of pitchers on the team, Gus Hallborg and Pete Marisoff. Hallborg is from uh, Massachusetts. Uh, Marisoff is from uh, LA. Joe Faria and George White, more pitchers. Uh, Joe is from uh, Oakland, California. He had, uh, was property to the San Diego Padres, meaning that Padres farmed him out to Spokane. Uh, so they owned his contract and could, could recall him, just like uh, uh, was the case with Jack Workey. Uh, George Lyden was from uh, the Idaho Panhandle. Uh, he had signed with Spokane uh, before the war. Uh, he was married and had two young boys. A few other players uh, here. Uh, Milt Tadina uh, was the team's best pitcher. Uh, he had uh, played in the Pacific Coast League a bit um, uh, before the war. Uh, spent several um, uh, months in both the Pacific and European theaters during World War II. Irv Kanalka was a catcher uh, from Milwaukee, and Dick Powers was uh, a pitcher from California who had played with uh, Sacramento. So the team uh, had come together uh, during these, these first couple months of the season. They had uh, a lot of talent, and it, it was clear that they were going to be able to compete for the pennant that year. Uh, as of June 23rd, they were in the thick of the race. They had a record of 32 and 26. They were five and a half games behind first place uh, Salem. But well within striking distance, still had a, a shot of winning the pennant that year. Uh, several players were hitting over 300: Martinez, Lurky, Risk, McCormick, and Patterson. Uh, Pachetti was not far behind at 285. And now they had welcomed these recent uh, former major leaguers, Ben Garrity and uh, Chris Archie, and so they were poised to <coughs> run the pennant. One thing I was able to uh, include in the book um, were uh, letters from a couple of the players. Um, the families of Vic Pachetti and Bob Patterson uh, both uh, provided me with letters that these uh, players had written and kind of gave me a, a sense of what they were thinking and uh, very helpful in, in, in telling their story. So I'd like to leave, uh, read uh, Vic Pachetti's letter to his mother on uh, uh, June 21st, 1946. Near Ma, well, only one month and you'll be here in Spokane. Sure is warm up here and will be really warm when you get here. Haven't been doing very good, but just have to keep trying, I suppose. I'll get you a cabin. I think I can get one with two bedrooms, kitchen, bathroom, and sofa and such out by the ballpark. We had one there for a while, and it wasn't bad. It cost $24 a week. I saw Hoodlum Saint with William Powell and Esther Williams, and also a dual horror show, which wasn't bad. Outside of that, haven't been doing anything. Well, I'll see you soon. So take care of yourself, and hello to everybody. Love always, Junior. That was pretty typical of um, what Vic's letters looked like. Uh, he wrote his mom every week and talked about what movies he had seen, uh, how he was doing. Always said, say hello to his younger brother Bobby and sister Beverly. So the Indians uh, traveled in uh, a charter bus, which is a pre war bus, 25 passenger, uh, that they chartered from a company called the Washington Motor Coach Company. So on June 23rd, they had uh, defeated the Salem Senators, the first place team they were trying to catch in the standings, and they had a come from behind victory. So they were in, in high spirits when they gathered in Spokane uh, on the late morning of June 24th as they prepared to travel to Riverton for their next series. 
Two players, Mil Kadena and Joe Faria, decided they would drive separately. Uh, Joe had a convertible, so he invited uh, his buddy Mil, and, uh, and they went with their wives uh, separately, so they were not on the bus. This was from a letter that uh, Vic Pachetti had written a couple months earlier in the season on May 1st. He said, we go all over in the lousy bus, sure is miserable. We went 420 miles to Salem, Oregon, and it took 16 hours. In fact, this was before uh, interstate travel. There, uh, there was no I-90. So to get from Spokane to uh, Seattle, uh, subsequently Bremerton, they had to travel on uh, US Route 10, which is a two-lane road, known as the Sunset Highway. The first automobiles crossed Snohomie Pass not too long before uh, 1946, just uh, a few decades before. The first gravel road was completed in 1915. I saw one article in uh, one of the Seattle newspapers that said a trip from Seattle to Yakima around that time took 10 hours. So the team left Spokane and headed uh, West and stopped in here at Ellensburg. Uh, they had dinner at a place called Webster's Cafe. And while the team ate, the bus driver, who was a 24 year old uh, guy named Lindbergh, uh, took the bus to the Washington Motor Coach Company's local garage and he complained that uh, there was brake and engine trouble. Uh, mechanics uh, tried changing uh, the gas line, but as Berg later said, it didn't seem to do any good. Now, while the team ate dinner, a police officer tracked down Jack Norkey and passed along a message that he needed to call the Spokane Indians offices. Turned out that the San Diego Padres, the Pacific Coast League team who owned Jack's contract, were calling him up to the Pacific Coast League. So Jack gathered his belongings, said goodbye to his uh, friends, his teammates, including his two roommates, and you know the team was uh, was heading west. He needed to head east. His belongings were still in Spokane, so he hitchhiked back while the team carried on. Now, interestingly, the uh, some of you might uh, be familiar with this uh, story. The place that they had stopped, the Webster Cafe, which is in the Webster Hotel, uh, at the southwest corner of Third and Pearl, nearby here, um, caught fire in 1980 uh, during the winter. It was below freezing. And uh, this is what the building looked like. And I guess it, um, they couldn't really do anything about it until it saw it. And then the building collapsed. Yes. Webster's Cafe was in a different building than Webster's Hotel. Oh, okay. Webster's Hotel was on 3rd Street. Uh, Webster's Cafe was in the middle of Pearl between 3rd and 4th. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. Uh, correct me on that. Okay. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I figured I, I might find some local suit. Uh... <laughs> yeah, they, they didn't eat at Webster's Cafe. It was important. So the team carried on. The bus reached the Holly Pass uh, around 8 p.m. and it was right around the dusk, and a light rain was falling. Less than a mile past the bus driver Glenn Berg swerved to the shoulder because an oncoming car crossed over the center line. Berg struggled to get the uh, bus back on the road and kind of lost control of the bus, and it began to take uh, take out guardrail posts and the uh, wire guardrail. The bus broke through the guardrail and tumbled uh, 300 feet down a rocky ravine and caught fire as it rolled. Uh, six players uh, were killed um, instantly. And quickly, uh, passersby uh, notified uh, authorities and uh, rescue efforts were initiated, but it was incredibly difficult because of uh, it was now dark, uh, it was raining. They had uh, crashed in this rocky ravine. All of the rocks were slick. 
and just accessing uh, the uh, crash scene proved to be incredibly difficult. They brought in uh, lights from Olympia to um, provide lighting so that rescuers could, could see what they were doing. A couple of the uh, rescuers, uh, police officers, were, were injured themselves. So six players uh, were pronounced dead at the scene. Uh, Vic Pichetti died on the way to the hospital. Two other players died over the next uh, one to two days. George Lydon and Chris Hurgeon. The bus driver, Glenn Berg, as well as six passengers, uh, Ben Garrity, Gus Halberg, Levi McCormick, or Kavka, Dave Powers, and Pete Parasov survived the crash with varying degrees of injuries. This is Ben Garrity, pictured here shortly after the crash. He had a, a large cut on his head and broke his kneecap. So you've heard me kind of describe um, this accident, um, and now I'd like to hear it from um, some of the men who were involved. Um, in 2001, this is the same year that uh, Seattle hosted the All-Star Game, uh, CNN uh, ran a, uh, a short clip in which they interviewed um, a few of the surviving players. It may be baseball's 72nd All-Star Game, but this one will be unlike any other. As, ba as baseball says goodbye to two of its all-time great ambassadors, Cal Ripken Jr. and Tony Gwynn. Three days from now, the entire baseball world will revolve around Seattle. But Washington State has played a part in baseball's story past before. An unfortunate part, home to one of the game's biggest tragedies. Tom Rinaldi with a story you may not know, but once you do, it's one you won't soon forget. If hope had a favorite year, it might have been 1946. And in 1946, everyone's favorite sport was baseball. World War II was over. Soldiers were coming back all over America, many hoping to trade battlefields for ball fields. Spokane, Washington was no exception. But the 1946 season for the Spokane Indians, that would be exceptional in a fateful way. <laughs> Here we had such a nice, good team and everything like that, and here it was all shattered. Oh, it's the most sickening feeling you ever had. And there's no minimizing it. This was a horrifying accident. The 46 Indians of the Western International League had talent and depth, a mix of war veterans and high school hopefuls. They were in the thick of a pennant race in late June that year. On the morning of the 24th, the team gathered outside Ferris Field, ready to board a bus for a cross-state road trip. Because a road trip in the, in the 40s was something else. This was right after the war, and the bus equipment was in very poor shape. It was just worn out. There were uh, 17 people on the bus, uh, 16 players, including the player manager, Mel Cole, uh, and the bus driver. And they did indeed uh, stop at Ellensburg to uh, have their meal. Fate would stop with one player and prevent another from boarding the bus at all. The Indians' ace pitcher, Milt Kadena, was supposed to be on the bus trip. But at the last minute, a teammate convinced him and his wife to make the journey in a separate car. I was going on the bus. I was on the bus. Even when I was with, uh, with uh, Tacoma, all the bus trips with uh, Spokane. I always drove in the bus, except this one time that I, I didn't go in the bus. Star third baseman Jack Lorkey did ride the bus, but while eating in Ellensburg, he was suddenly called from the table. I picked up the phone and they said, uh, you've been recalled by San Diego and uh, come back to Spokane as soon as you can. We were all... Uh, happy for him and congratulated him and everything like that. Of course, we hated to lose him because he was a he was a heck of a third baseman. So I said goodbye to everybody on the bus. And then uh, I bummed back to Spokane. 
The rest of the team then continued west, climbing through the Cascade Mountains. It was misty and unusually cold as dusk fell. The bus traveled over the Snoqualmie Pass, the motor coach approaching 3,000 feet. And the river was way, was quite a ways down below. And uh, so we were looking over, you know, and I said, gee, that's a hell of a place to, if you ever had to, to go over the side. Just moments later, possibly trying to avoid an oncoming car, down the west side of the summit, the bus suddenly swerved toward the edge of the highway. The bus lost its stability, broke through the cables and the posts, and then began to tumble down the hillside. And we were sliding right towards that uh, those posts and I thought oh my gosh this can't be happening it overturned at least twice bounced once on its top and fell about 350 feet maybe 400 feet down that steep ravine and landed astride a log near the bottom of the ravine and then it burst into flames I was up in the middle of the bus stooped down because the roof had caved in you know been knocked in a little bit and uh, gathered my wits as best I could and realized I had to get out of there because the front end of the bus was in flames then. People were burned to death. People were crushed or smashed against rocks. Six players died at the scene. Another died on the way to the hospital. Another one died the day after that and catcher Chris Harchie, who was horribly burned, died three or four days later. Eight of the nine Spokane players who perished had survived World War II, only to return home, join a team, and die on a bus. Many in America, and especially in the West, were shocked. And Milt Kadena, who decided to take that car at the last minute, he got the news just after reaching Seattle. When my wife said, look, at that, the bus went over, the, went over a cliff, and Milt, Milt if you hadn't, we hadn't gone with Joe, you would have been on that bus and you wouldn't be here today. And Jack Lorkey, who left the bus just hours before the crash, he returned to Spokane and heard the news. I sent a telegram to my mother and dad, safe and sound back in Spokane. Love, Jack. And they didn't know what happened. I spoke with uh, Jack Lorkey's uh, son, and it, Jack was very private and um, was never comfortable uh, giving interviews and was very reluctant to participate. And I think it kind of shows in uh, how short his answers are, but you, you can clearly see uh, the emotion on his face despite the number of years that, that had passed. So after the crash, uh, there was an outpouring of support. Uh, the news of the crash uh, ran in newspapers across the country. Uh, and immediately, uh, people started calling uh, most of the Spokane newspapers, uh, asking what they could do to help. And donations started pouring in. A uh, benefit fund was established. Uh, Bob Pope donated $500. Uh, Spokane residents held a hole-in-one contest. And the first one to sink a hole in one uh, actually won an airplane. And then somebody actually did uh, to win that airplane. <laughs> uh, a benefit game was uh, played at Ferris Field. This is the, the program uh, for that game. It was between uh, the Oakland Oaks, uh, Casey Stengel's team. They played the uh, Seattle Rainiers on July 8th. Uh, Bing Crosby bought $2,500 uh, worth of tickets. Bing, Bing was, of course, from Spokane, played baseball at uh, Gonzaga, and he donated the tickets to uh, military veterans. Uh, all told, more than $100,000, which uh, would be roughly equivalent to $1.8 million today, was raised, and that money was uh, dispersed to uh, the survivors and the uh, family members of the, those who had perished. About a week after the season, uh, the or excuse me, a week after the uh, accident, the season resumed. So the uh, uh, Spokane uh, owner Sam Collins was sort of determined to feel the team as quickly as possible. Uh, back then, um, a minor league running a minor league team was a was a business, and he had a business to run, and, and he quickly uh, tried to figure out how he could fill a roster. Um, 
he had basically a team of just two players now. Uh, these are the two pitchers uh, here uh, on both ends that had ridden in the convertible. Uh, this is Pete Beresoff and uh, Ben Garrity, uh, two of the uh, survivors of the crash. This was just about a week later. Uh, they were desperate, so they turned to semi-pro players, uh, minor league players who've been released by other teams. Uh, the team trainer, Dutch Anderson, suited up for some games, uh, and things did not go well uh, on the field for the uh, Indians after that. Uh, they were 22 and 50, 52, so 30 games below 500 um, the rest of the way, and finished in seventh place ahead of only uh, Victoria. Uh, Levi McCormick, uh, who survived the crash, played one more season in Spokane, but had uh, some nagging injuries uh, related to the crash and uh, gave up his baseball career. Uh, after the 47th season, he uh, went to work as a postal carrier um, until uh, dying from a heart attack in 1974. Uh, he's one of four players inducted into the Spokane Indians Rim of Honor. Uh, the others are Tommy Lasorda, Maury Wills, and Dwight Aiden. Uh, ben Garrity, um, he survived the crash and um, was hired to manage the Spokane Indians a year later. Uh, dreamed of managing in the, in the big leagues. He uh, often said he, he felt like he survived this crash for a reason. And so he set his sights on uh, becoming a major league manager was, was, his, was his goal. He was hired by the New York Giants to manage uh, one of their minor league teams uh, and then had, had a couple of successful years there and was then hired by the Milwaukee Braves to manage their uh, Class A team in Jacksonville. And that's where he managed uh, Hank Aaron. In 1953, uh, Hank Aaron and two of his teammates, Felix Mantilla and Horace Garner, uh, were the first players of color to play in the South Atlantic League. Uh, Aaron later called Garrity the greatest manager I ever played for and maybe the greatest manager who ever lived. So Aaron thought very highly of uh, Ben. Now Ben had a, a very successful run as a minor league manager, but uh, was sort of haunted by the uh, demons of this crash. Uh, a minor league uh, player from the Brave system um, later went on to become a journalist. Uh, his name is Pat Jordan. He wrote an excellent memoir uh, called A False Spring. Um, excellent book if you ever uh, see a copy of that. So well worth the read. Uh, I'll just read a, a couple quotes from uh, Pat Jordan in that book describing uh, Ben and some of the things he coped with uh, after the accident. Ben would sit behind the driver and consume a case of beer each trip in an attempt to drown away the nightmarish images his memory played, replayed of that horrible crash. Ben searched for signs, and as he did, his shoulder jerked left and right, and his foot stabbed the floor. When the bus arrived at its destination, the players would wait to find a manager who had consumed all his beer and simply looked more haggard than usual. In describing how the accident may have, in some ways, helped Garrity become a better manager. Jordan wrote, he saw, his, he saw beyond his players to the things they'd say and do before they said and did them. In the process, he began to know his players better than they knew themselves. This deepened perception was what made Ben Garrity a great manager and a great man, and he owed it all to the accident. As I mentioned, um, Ben unfortunately turned to drinking alcohol as a way of coping with uh, bus travel. Of course, he was still managing the minor leagues. That's how teams travel city to another was by bus. Uh, I interviewed several players uh, who had um, played for Ben. Um, I mentioned how John earlier, John Barrett. Um, they gave me some insights about uh, Ben. All uh, mentioned that. Um, how great a manager he was, but also that he loved his beer. Uh, and that ultimately, unfortunately, uh, alcohol use probably contributed to some of the health problems that he had, and he uh, died in 1963 uh, at the age of 50. 
Jack Dorkey. So after being called away from here in Ellsburg to join the San Diego Padres, he performed incredibly well. Hit 303 with eight home runs and 48 RBIs uh, through the rest of the 1946 season. And as a result, the uh, Padres traded him to the Boston Braves that winter. However, the deal was nullified due to a, a paperwork issue in the commissioner's office. So instead, the New York Giants selected Lurkey in the Rule 5 draft. Now, quickly uh, after the accident, uh, Lurkey acquired uh, a nickname, which he was never comfortable with, but uh, it was very fitting given his uh, numerous brushes with that. Lucky Lurkey. Jack had a, a pretty good rookie season in 1947. Uh, got his first hit uh, on April 18th of that year. Uh, it was the same day that Jackie Robinson hit his first home run. Uh, Jack hit 11 home runs as a rookie, including the Giants' 183rd home run of the season, a mark which broke the uh, Yankees' previous single season. Jack appeared in the 1951 World Series, which the uh, Giants lost to Casey Stengel's Yankees. Uh, in total, Jack played seven seasons in big leagues for the Giants and Phillies, and then wrapped up his uh, baseball career in the, the Coast League. And if, if his life weren't interesting enough, after baseball, he did high-level security work on the CIA. Mm -hmm. So that sort of concludes my, my talk about the 1946 Indians. Uh, of course, the Spokane Indians still exist today. Uh, they have gone through different iterations over the years. Uh, from 1959 to 1971, they were the AAA home of the Los Angeles Dodgers and had some extremely successful teams with a lot of great players come through Spokane during those years. The 1970 team alone, uh, widely considered perhaps the greatest minor league team that's ever been uh, put together, including Steve Garvey, Tom Short, Bobby Valentine, Bill Buckner, Charlie Huff, Baby Wolves, a lot of uh, household names. Uh, and of course, they are managed by Tommy Lasorda. Today, the Spokane Indians are a single A affiliate of the Colorado Rockies. Um, they still maintain the name Spokane Indians. Of course, that's, that's been a controversial topic, but uh, Spokane uh, addressed that in a uh, by collaborating with the Spokane tribe. Uh, they the Indians ball club did offer to drop the name Indians about 20 years ago, but the tribe encouraged them to keep the name and instead use it as a way of educating the community. And they came up with this jersey here, which includes the Salish uh, language, which is what they wear today. Uh, last summer, I uh, retraced the path, the path of the Spokane Indians. Uh, a good friend of mine from Oklahoma came out and we, we drove to Spokane, went to a couple of games, and then uh, drove the same path that the uh, Indians took. There's part of uh, Route 10 still exists between uh, Ritzville and uh, Moses Lake, uh, the original US Route 10. Uh, the two lane road where the crash occurred is uh, just, just over the pass. It's now a forest um, service road. Uh, this is the uh, what the uh, guardrail. These are this is still standing uh, near the crash site. Uh, what the uh, metal guard wire uh, guard post looks like. Right. This is a uh, telegram that Vic Pachetti sent to his uh, mother when he arrived in Spokane in April of 1946. This is a talk, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, um, did the bus accident uh, affect any other leagues that were going on? Like specifically, I'm uh, speaking of the West Coast Negro League that was only around in 1946. 
Uh, their opening day was on June 1st, and then they shut down shortly after June 24th. Uh, do you believe that there may have been any correlation as far as uh, weariness about travel, uh, getting two games? I know that specifically the Seattle Steelheads, which were in the West Coast Negro League, uh, were supposed to play games in Spokane as well, home games mm -hmm. there as well. Okay, so I wonder if that may have factored in, or if you, during your research, if you found any other leagues that may have, like, said, hey, let's just not travel, let's keep it a little bit closer to home rather than. Sure, yeah, the timing sure is curious. Uh, you mentioned those dates, but I, I did not see any uh, indi indication that uh, any other teams or leagues were, were affected. I think, in, in some ways, the, they, they were able to explain the crash. Uh, you know, it was a, a vehicle that had crossed the, the center line. Um, so in some ways, a bit of a, a, a fluke accident. Um, so I, I, and given how quickly they, the Indians resumed their season and then they did travel uh, for the rest of that season, um, I, I didn't come across that it had uh, impacted that. But that is a good, good question about the, given the timing of the, uh, when the league shut down. Yes. Did that, did the fallout from that accident affect how professional teams traveled and uh, whether they were all together or whether they traveled separately or what? Yeah, it, it did not seem to uh, change that in any way. Uh, teams still all traveled together by bus, including Ben Garrity's teams when you know, he, he was managing later in the minor leagues. He, uh, would always sit in the front row, but you know, the whole team traveled. It was, um, I, think, I think, pretty unusual in, in this case. As Mel Cadena uh, mentioned in the CNN video, he was it was the first time he had ever not ridden the bus. Uh, so the team almost always traveled uh, together. Um, unfortunately, there, um, yeah, there hasn't been a, an accident uh, this tragic, at least in terms of um, professional baseball, of course. Uh, part of that had to do with, with infrastructure and how teams travel now is a lot different than it was uh, back then. Yes. Um, <clears throat> what can you tell me about Dick Pichetti? Yeah. Where did he grow up in San Francisco? Do you remember the high school he went to? Yes, it was a uh, Mission High School. Mission, okay. Uh -huh. My mom went to Mission. Oh, really? Yes, he was. <laughs> and Bob Patterson, his uh, teammate, also went to Mission High just a couple of years mm -hmm. after Dick. Yes. When the team was scrambling for replacements after the accident, did they ever look at the Negro Leagues? I don't think they did, um, which is unfortunate. Um, yeah, this accident occurred in first June of '46. Uh, in the fall of '45, is when Branch Rickey had signed uh, Jackie Robinson, and, and Jackie Robinson was playing in Montreal in '46. Yeah, um, unfortunately, that, that was not the case, but. Yes. In researching and um, putting together this book, how much of uh, the time you spent would you say was fun and how much of the time was work? <laughs> well, I, I'd say it, the majority is fun, for sure. Um, really, I enjoyed um, sort of digging into uh, the newspaper archive and, and just trying to find little facts and trying to find as much detail as I could. Um, and you know, just, just finding those those little nuggets here and there uh, to try to fill in the story and make it as complete as possible uh, was was mostly fun. I would say that a very small amount uh, of work and, and mostly, uh, but of course, it was. Um, I mean, writing about an event like this, um, it was a, I had a happier ending in many ways, um, but at the same time, I, could, I felt like it was an important story to tell, even even though it was had a lot of sadness in it. Yes, it's your next book. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my wife asked me that the other day. I did Red Birds. Um, that that was with me about a year. And then I said, I'm going to take six months off 
And within two weeks, I was, I was working on this because I started digging into it and just, I was finding so much information and just dove in. Um, and as a result, I uh, finished this book. Uh, first book was sort of in process uh, with the publisher. Um, Cardinal's book came out uh, the fall of last year, and then this one is coming up to like back to book. So I've been very busy with just um, trying to get the word out and now doing events like this. So I'd love to find a project that I um, feel was happy about as I did with this one. Probably about baseball and something. <laughs> and we were talking earlier. Uh, Bob and I grew up in Spokane, and we uh, attended a lot of the games in the late fifties, and then when they became Triple A, yeah, in the early sixties. But I was trying to remember where Ferris Field because Ferris is a high school. But do, do, do you know where Ferris Field is in Spokane? Or was it was um, there was a horse racing track? Oh, there it was the place. Yeah, Playfair. Playfair was just beyond the outfield wall. Ah. Uh, and there were railroad tracks uh, yeah. along the third and first base line, and the railroad tracks converged mm -hmm. behind home plate. Not too far from yeah. downtown. Yeah. 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 You're awesome. Yeah. So I could face people. Uh, and Bob Carball from Ellensburg for, since 1985. I was born. Spokane, October 1926, and uh, by the early 50s, my dad was taking me and my brother, especially me, to some of the games at Ferris Field. Uh, and by the time I was, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years old, I would hear my dad that my the full time and, and they would be reliving the story. And I grew up, you know, as a kid with the story in mind, even though I didn't know the details. Thank you. But I, I knew the uh, knew the story of, and the essence of it. And then in 1959, the Spokane Indians. The, uh, the city, the county, which now built the new stadium in 1959. And my dad had a small cement block business. His cement blocks built the restaurants, some of the concession stands, and some of the buildings within the Spokane. A baseball park that exists today. And so when I look back at all of this and here in tonight's talk, you know, I have very fond memories of all sorts of this. And thank you very much for being here tonight. I, I greatly appreciate this. Thanks for sharing those, those memories. Sure. Yeah, the ballpark, uh, the Vista Stadium is what it's called now. It's a really cool park. It's, um, sort of reminds me of Dodger Stadium. That's kind of from that era, uh, and they they maintained it really well. Yeah, one of your pictures showed two players, and they had their gloves up, and um, that was the era when the the pinky was not attached to anything. There was no webbing going all the way through. When did when do you remember that they actually changed that to where the pinky was attached to everything? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Uh, good catch. Uh, gosh, I don't know. That's a that's a that really was funny seeing pinky <laughs> yeah. yes. <laughs> out. I said a quick quick anecdote about Highway 10, we, I grew up in Spokane, going to Seattle was a big deal, but it took a long time, and the freeway was finally finished, 1970, 70, 71, somewhere, yeah. but you go up to Spokane, Seattle, and there'd be four lanes for a while, then back to two lanes, later 70s, mm -hmm. 
But in the sixties, it was a long trip, and he went through he went through a number of towns, including Moses Lake, Woodsville, Spring, uh, Moses Lake, Ellensburg, Cleelum, and then North Bend. North Bend was the last one to have a stoplight. Different <laughs> now. You talked about the minor leagues producing from uh, many leagues to a very few uh, mm -hmm. in front of the war. There's been a huge reorganization of minor league baseball. What are, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I, th I think it's unfortunate in some ways that they've, they've reduced uh, some of the teams. I, like uh, teams in Montana, for instance, uh, are now uh, in like a summer collegiate league instead of, of affiliated baseball. So it, it's kind of robbed um, some of those smaller towns of, of professional baseball. Um, you know, they still have those, those collegiate summer teams, but it's, um, it's unfortunate, I think, because you know, back then it seemed like uh, I'm doing this research. Almost every town it seemed like had a, a minor league team, uh, kind of any you know any significant. So um, I think it's unfortunate in some ways, uh, but I can see the other side of it as well because it's all about, of course, uh, money and uh, the business in the end. What was your lifetime batting average? <laughs> <laughs> I think I did three years. I was I was having a bench for more or less. So I I called butt hits, which says something about my ability. I was actually more of a pitcher. Um, okay, but I did. I mean, I picture me hitting it. Um, Bush Stadium. I did reach on a fielder's choice, so I got to run the bases. So that was just yeah, nice. So, um, so Webster's Cafe was separate than. Um, yeah, in the hotel. Um, so is, is the building where Webster's Cafe is uh, still there? It's not being utilized in the food industry anymore. And I think there's, if you go, uh, which is just a block or so down here, take a right and uh, you'll see an optical shop next to DM Coffee. Oh, yeah. DM Coffee was originally Monday's shoe store. And then, uh, Further down the street was Webster's Cafe. They used to have a, a ramp up into it, but it was, uh, you had Webster's Smoke Shop. Uh, and then there was a bar. Uh, the Smoke Shop had mounts, uh, elk heads, deer, uh, fish that had been caught or uh, harvested in the valley back in the 1920s, 1930s. Um, the restaurant itself was uh, on the north side of the smoke shop and bar. And they had, I remember, these cartoon characters uh, painted on the walls. Remember that? Yeah. yeah. Um, ballroom steps up. Ballroom steps up on the banquet room. Uh, Webster family, I think they own. Both of those. Um, eventually, the hotel got sold. The restaurant was operated by the Plano Webster family and more relatives up through the 1980s. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I have to add that. Which is their name? Oh, well, the, team, the team definitely ate at Webster's Cafe. And as I was putting this talk together, I was looking blind and I. I saw the hotel, so I thought there was a connection, so I really appreciate you directing me on that. My, my neighbor across the street, I live on Strange Road, named after Willie Strange, but uh, Ed West was a fire captain in the fire. And he, we still, I go where to see him, he's, he's 93 now. But he talks about that fire, it was him. <laughs> The temperature was 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's one huge big chunk there. And then I think in 1980. Yes. Good. This is for the old guys with gray hair. $3,000 a 
Signing books. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to sign. Okay. Uh, there are some baseball cards that I don't think they're as valuable as the 52 <laughs> Mickey Mouse table. Grab some uh, baseball <laughs> parts. <laughs> 